This conference will now be recorded. All right, folks, so good evening. We are in uh, the autonomic nervous system. And so you'll see here that we're going into um, using the Scott Fong text as well as the Rizzo text uh, for this. If you look at and study the PowerPoint that uh, Dr. Massimo and I have worked on, in particular, I, I spent a lot of time on this one here. It's a short PowerPoint, but it's chock full of a lot of information and so in concepts that you need to process and, and recall regarding uh, for your tests and such. And so I will, I think it's already posted for you as far as when the test will be. And I know that it's it's a little weird for the first test here that we have. It's split up between the groups as far as group A and group B. Uh, and know that there's a week between the two. It's just a matter of, um, you know, we would ask and myself, Dr. Massimo, and the administration that, you know, no one talk about the test that you've taken if you've taken the test early, right? So that that would be cheating. So we don't do that. We wouldn't share that information with each other. And that um, this is the reason why we're giving it on campus is so that you can take it while you're on campus. And so it can be proctored instead of being online. Yes, yeah, so if we have to go online and we have done this in the past, we make do with what we have, but we really wanna make sure that, um, you know, all of our testing is done on campus as far as for this class is concerned. Okay, so uh, any questions regarding that, you can reach out to me, send me an email. Um, you'll see here, as far as the autonomic nervous system, recall that uh, those that have taken me in the past um, for AMP1 know that I just I would describe the autonomic nervous system as the automatic nervous system, right? So there's no conscious control over what takes place and that really the autonomic nervous system has a control via the hypoth hypothalamus present within the uh, third ventricle and also the pituitary gland. So nervous system, endocrine system, and, and the uh, different hormones that are associated with the endocrine system are really involved in controlling what takes place as far as autonomic nervous system control and uh, functions of the body and such. And so we'll be, that's our focus for this chapter. And so, Let's move on and get into here. And we'll have a review as far as, so when you think of the autonomic or the somatic, somatic, think of soma as body, right? Represents the body. Uh, when we think of the soma of, the, of, a, of a neuron, of a nerve cell, um, we would think of the body of the nerve cell. So somatic nervous system, we're, we're control over what goes on as far as the musculature, the, what we have voluntary control over, right? So we're thinking of skeletal muscle. And we're thinking of, the neuromuscular junction. And so we looked at, uh, we spent quite a bit of time last semester in the muscular system regarding skeletal muscle contraction and what takes place at the neuromuscular junction and how it's a one synapse system. It's a chemical synapse and it's where the nerve and the muscle interact. There's a communication that takes place. A chemical is released within the synaptic cleft. That's a space where the, the nervous system, right, the axon terminal, and the motor end plate of the muscle fiber, there's no connection, there's no touching, but there still is, there's that gap where that acetylcholine, that neurotransmitter is released, and this causes change to take place at the um, postsynaptic um, uh, region there. So presynaptic would be the um, axon terminal, postsynaptic would be the motor end plate, and that would be really the um, sarcolemma of the muscle fiber that's being uh, stimulated via the acetylcholine and such. So you'll see here cell bodies of the motor neurons are located within the central nervous system and the axons are what extend to the skeletal muscle. So somatic nervous system, one synapse. And so we're gonna see autonomic nervous system different from synapse, uh, somatic in that there are two synapses present, okay? There's a preganglionic and a postganglionic uh, neurons present. And we're gonna see that in order to di differentiate between whether we have a parasympathetic or sympathetic stimulation, we're going to have differences in the anatomy of the structure of the first and second uh, neurons present within this autonomic uh, stimulation. And we'll see that depending upon whether in um, sympathetic or parasympathetic, whether we have a short preganglionic neuron and a longer postganglionic neuron or a long preganglionic neuron and a short postganglionic neuron. It'll make more sense as we go on and move on into the uh, to the PowerPoint and discuss as far as what's taking place here. Okay. And here you're seeing the example of uh, at the very bottom, at the inferior aspect of this image here, you're seeing, um, so here we have dorsal, dorsal root, ventral root. Here would be as far as in the spinal cord, ventral, is, aka anterior. Uh, dorsal, aka posterior, 
So we're receiving, so receiving afferent information, receiving sensory input. But here, as far as motor output, this would pass through uh, the ventral root and through via the uh, spinal nerve and into the interaction between the axon terminal and the uh, muscle fiber of the skeletal muscle that's being innervated, that's being sent this information so that we can have skeletal muscle contraction, okay? And here we're looking at as far as autonomic is concerned, and we're seeing here that we have a two neuron system. Now, this is a very important um, breakdown of the nervous system. And know that we have one nervous system, one nervous system with many branches and different departments, right? Different areas, different divisions, but we would say that it's only one nervous system, right? So the central nervous system is, is really the brain and the spinal cord. Everything else is peripheral nervous system. And you'll see here as far as afferent, A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T information is being sent to the central nervous system. And then efferent, E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T information is being sent uh, away from, that's the motor output. So we have sensory input in blue, blue uh, arrows here, motor output in red arrows. Okay? And again, you're seeing that peripheral nervous system is everything else, including cranial and spinal nerves, right? And we have here also as far as the, um, what's going on as far as the autonomic nervous system, as well as the somatic nervous system, okay? Voluntary control, um, one uh, synapse, autonomic nervous system, two synapses, and we have here as far as the uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic. So here, again, and this is just a, re a really a review, this aspect of it, as far as realizing that, hey, sympathetic, preparing the body for action. I'll say that again. Sympathetic division prepares the body for action. So whether you fight, whether you whether you fight or whether you flight, you're running. <laughs> That's what's taking place as far as the sympathetic division is concerned. Mobilizes body systems during an activity and it's under stress, right? So sympathetic division thinks stress. Parasympathetic, all right, conserving energy. Rest and digest. This is what we're talking about with the parasympathetic as far as its control. And what takes place as far as also the, um, the uh, mnemonic as far as the uh, S-L-U-D-D, salivation, saliva, right? So saliva production, so involved in digestion. Um, you think, so as lacrimation, tear production, urination for the U, then you think also um, digestion and defecation, all processes involved under the uh, parasympathetic uh, division and stimulation, okay? But again, another one is rest and digest. You know, the, the calm periods of throughout most of the day, parasympathetic influence. But when there's some type of stressful situation, so it doesn't have to be an actual bear. So I've, I've had, I've probably mentioned this before, but if those of you have not had me, I've had bear as close as like within like a six feet of me from, I, I was talking to one of my, my mechanic at one time and I had a bear walk right past us, right behind my mechanic and right along the building that we were at his garage. and you know, like when you see something like that, you're like a bear. Bear means they're going to try and hurt. Well, you know, pretty much as long as you leave them alone, usually. Yeah, that was pretty. That was a pretty intense situation, and and I was like, holy cow! <laughs> um, and that gets the adrenaline, the the epinephrine with it. Like you're like, whoa, okay, what am I going to do? Um, I've also been when we lived in uh, Mount Bethel, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, we there was you know a little bit over an acre of land, and uh, we had we had. Um, farmland as well as uh, uh, woods and such, not far, not very far away. And so we'd have bear pass through the the the, the property. And uh, well, if it's a grizzly, you better pray for your life. And that is true, <laughs> absolutely. I, I can't even imagine. There's a video, do you know that there's a video on YouTube with a guy that's taking, uh, that's taking pictures of, of grizzlies in a stream in a river? And a bear, a grizzly, comes right next to where he's taking these pictures, sits down next to him on it, where he's got a chair set up, sits right next to him, and then gets up and moves away. And I'm like, holy cow, I can't imagine the adrenaline that's going through you at that period of time. <laughs> yes, you've, you've, some of you have seen that. Um, but I, I've had it also where, in that kind of instance also, where, you know, within like a 20 feet 
space, a bear has walked behind me and I've only noticed it after I'm doing, I was on the ground doing some work, doing some uh, work on my um, my steps to, to my porch. And I had one of my, my relatives bang on the window and, and go, hey, I turn around and I see a bear 20 feet away. That was pretty scary too also. So yeah, so, and, and, and not to be goofy, but I've had dreams of bears. Did do you recall, how about this, do you recall? I think this was, was in Ohio where a men, uh, understood. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah, black bears understood. Um, where there was a, yeah, it's just, uh, it's something else, boy, I'll tell you. Um, there, was, there was a case in Ohio, I believe, where uh, a, a, ment, um, a, a gentleman who had some mental health issues and quite sad. And so he was like not really like taking care of his animals because he had too many animals to take care of and, and he wasn't able to feed them properly. And so this is a bad situation. And so he was having problems with, I believe, the government. And uh, <laughs> thanks, Jen. And he ended up... Um, he ended up letting his animals loose. This was lions, tigers, and not to be goofy, but lions, tigers, and bears. Yikes. Oh my. Right. I mean, this was like a very sad, he let, he had gorillas. He had like all these kind of crazy wildlife and they had to kill them, folks. That's very sad because he let them out. In, ah, there you go, Kyle. He had to let them out. Uh, he let, he didn't have to let them out. He let them out and then he killed himself. He, by suicide right so um and then so they had to take care of these animals they couldn't just they were just running wild in the streets how crazy is that that's just that's extremely scary so anyway getting back to my phobia of bears but think about it, though you know sympathetic now here so i want to address the subject of that so something can be an actual scary situation right that stimulate the sympathetic nervous system or how about more of a perceived fear so how about you're, you're going for a job interview or, or you're meeting um, a significant other's uh, relatives for the very first time, or somebody has uh, been diagnosed with a bad, very dangerous and scary and catastrophic type illness, and you're going to find results uh, as far as their test results regarding this, uh, what they've had testing done, say it's CAT scan or whatever it may be. Like any kind of situation where, you know, just, yeah, it's 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 a very stressful situation, but not so much like a bear or someone who's going to rob you or that, but more mentally perceived anxiety, right? These can all also stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, which could in turn, folks, be a, a situation where it could lead to a lot of detrimental effects uh, down the road. We're going to talk about, um, in particular, the uh, the effects of long-term stress when we get into the uh, endocrine system mix chapter. I, I find I have to tell you. So as much as I I really think the uh, nervous system is my favorite body system, if you have to call it, you know that I just I really enjoy neurology and I'm fascinated by it and uh, really listen to podcasts about it. Just cool stuff. Um, but the endocrine system also, folks, I have to tell you with with the uh, homeostasis, the stable environment within, as a result, what, whatever goes on outside of us, right? To maintain that stability and the delicate balance of these hormones, these chemicals surging through our bodies and at different levels throughout and, and higher levels, depending upon different circumstances going on. Um, really, the endocrine system is also another fascinating system. And so we will not only learn uh, the endocrine system, but we'll learn many of the pathologies associated with the endocrine system and whether we have um, too high chemicals or too low chemicals uh, circulating in the body and such. And so uh, I, th I think that you'll find that all very fascinating. I, I also think, like I said, the endocrine system, another very fascinating system of, of the body. So let's go. So we, we've taken this. So really create a mental picture of this, folks, that you're that you're keeping in mind that, yes, we have sensory information. Afferent information will go from the sensory receptors of the body. Right. Special senses and other sensory receptors. And remember, except for olfaction, the sense of smell. They're going to pass through what area of the brain? The thalamus. Remember, thalamus is the sensory relay center of the brain. The thalamus. Okay, please, you know, keep that in mind and remember that. And then going to all the, the cortical areas of the different, so visual cortex, occipital lobe, et cetera. So 
the autonomic nervous system, right? Divided into these divisions, okay? As well as, and I didn't really talk about this, but the enteric nervous system. And so realize here, you'll see here, and we're gonna be discussing this in more detail, uh, not so much the, the nervous system portion of it, but, but just know we'll be discussing the digestive system in a couple few weeks there, okay? Um, but you'll see here, complex network of neuron cell bodies and axons within the walls of the GI tract. Okay, so very important to understand that, uh, that there is a division of the nervous system that is present within the digestive tract in order to maintain what's taking place within, okay? And very important to do that. You'll see again, I said to you, the uh, prepares the body for action, the fight or flight, sympathetic. Now there's another uh, division that we can call this by. Sympathetic division is also known as the thoracolumbar. We can say thoracolumbar region is where uh, these preganglionic cell bodies are located. And we can call it even the thoracolumbar division. Okay, so that's another term for the sympathetic division is the thoracolumbar division. Okay, and again, too, no, and you'll see here as far as those cell bodies, the preganglionic, right? Because there's two, right, for the autonomic nervous system, two neurons, preganglionic, postganglionic. Okay, now you'll see here as far as preganglionic axons pass through the ventral roots of the sympathetic chain ganglia. So interesting, right? So we're seeing here, it says thoracolumbar, we're seeing T1 to L2, L3, around there, okay? Uh, there can be variations to it as far as anatomical variations, but it, testing wise, T1 to L2. And know that these sympathetic chain ganglia are located adjacent to the spinal cord, okay? And on both, so bilateral on both sides. And so let's take a look at an image of <clears throat> just so you get an idea, and it's anterior too. There we go. Let's see here. There's a nice image of it, and I here we go. Here's a good one. This is one I've, I've shared in the past. And so what I like about this image here, you'll see, let's go here, good. So we're here we have, as far as an, a region of it, so we're, we're, we're not seeing L, you know, the, the lumbar division, but we're seeing here as far as this sympathetic chain ganglia, right? See these nodules, right? These areas here, the ganglia, we see them over here, bilateral, right? T1 to L2, okay? And it's really, so you'll see deep within, um, posterior two, you'll see here esophagus, you'll see here uh, the thoracic uh, aorta, right? Uh, trachea and such. Posterior to this, you'll have the spinal cord with the spinal nerve roots exiting off of, right? So here, this thoracic chain ganglia, this, this uh, T1 to L2, like I said, this is where you're going to have uh, the synapse for Here we go. The first synapse will take place, right? Because you'll have the pre-ganglionic pre neuron. The uh, cell bodies will be located here. And then you're going to have then. Um, and so what, what goes on is that. So think about this for a moment. I said to you that pre-ganglionic, post-ganglionic. I said to you that there are an area of the autonomic nervous system where the pre-ganglionic neurons have a short short preganglionic neurons and that the pre then the post are longer okay we'll come to an image Let me just show you this here we go so take a look at this image i just skipped forward just for a moment just so that you're understanding sympathetic right here at the sympathetic chain ganglia folks right so we have the first synapse taking place and then here's the second postganglionic neuron so preganglionic is short postganglionic is long Parasympathetic is opposite. Parasympathetic, long, preganglionic neuron, short, postganglionic neuron. In particular, it's the axon that we're looking at here that is long. Okay. So long pre, short post for parasympathetic, sympathetic, opposite, short pre, long post. And we're talking about the axons of these neurons. 
Okay. So again, here thinking that chain ganglia, the it's sympathetic chain ganglia, very close to the spine. So that's an easy way to remember. Well, sympathetic chain ganglia has to do with the sympathetic division, and it has to do with that the short pre, the long post. Okay, as far as ganglionic neurons are concerned, the axons of. And again, thinking of that. So if it's the sympathetic chain ganglia, it's in the T1 to L2 area. So we could call the sympathetic division the thoracolumbar division. Okay. And you'll just see here as far as that we have, and I'm not going to read this to you all, but you can just see here as far as the routes of those sympathetic axons and what's taking place as far as with the nerves and where they're going to, and eventually distal to this, the um, the postganglionic neurons. If it's the sympathetic division, what are we going to be using as far as a the second um, synapse? We'll be using epinephrine, norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter. The first synapse will be using acetylcholine. The second synapse will be using epinephrine, norepinephrine. Where is this produced? In the adrenal medulla, right? And um, Please, all of you, I hope that you got a chance to review the video that I prepared for class on Monday regarding not only just a review of special senses and the brain neural anatomy as far as the sagittal head and such, but also I reviewed right in the very beginning of that video um, endocrine histology. So, and I showed you as far as endocrine histology from the adrenal. Uh, cortex and medulla, the medullary area is the inner area, and this is what's neural tissue that's producing these ep norepinephrine and epinephrine as the uh, neurotransmitters. So just as we have acetylcholine for the um, uh, neuromuscular junction as the neurotransmitter, well, in the case of the adrenal medulla, epinephrine, norepinephrine are the neurotransmitters. So they're 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 unique in that they're neurohormones because also uh, working in conjunction with the endocrine system. So we'll discuss that in next chapter. Parasympathetic division. The parasympathetic, again, I said to you, rest and digest, SLUD, S-L-U-D-D. -D. We can call this the craniosacral region. We can call it the craniosacral division because uh, cranial nerves, number three, seven, uh, nine, and 10, and also sacral nerves, S2 to S4, are what are present regarding uh, the innervation for the parasympathetic division. Okay, so you'll see here preganglionic neurons are located uh, both superior and inferior to the thoracolumbar region, T1 to L2, okay, of the sympathetic division. Um, the terminal ganglia, right? These are really what's taking place. And remember that parasympathetic have a long presynaptic preganglionic neuron and a short postganglionic neuron and really it's taking place the postganglionic will then uh, innervate the actual target organ right that they're looking to show you I'll, I'll give you an image I've posted I added images that I've to this PowerPoint and and really created this PowerPoint from combination of the the, the text and uh, tried to give you as much information in a short small period of uh, PowerPoint presentation. Not a lot of slides in this PowerPoint, but there's a lot of information packed into this PowerPoint. So please make sure that you're doing all that you can to um, review your PowerPoints, take notes from your PowerPoints, and rewrite them many times, review them many times, create, um, create uh, what do they call, MP3s, right, sound bites that you can actually listen to. So even when you're tired and you don't want to listen to uh, and you don't want to really, you're not really in the mood to study, and you should be studying when you're in the car, commuting, whatever it may be that you're doing, um, you're laying down and you're kind of tired, but you still need to study. Hey, listen to, and really another thing also is that listening to these um, notes and such and whatever it is that you're trying to, to process, it's okay to do it before you go to sleep also. Put some headphones on, put some, you know, little earbuds in and listen before you go to bed. And then again, I've said this to you before, but your brain is actually processing this information even as you sleep, and you're not really think that you're you're thinking about this stuff, but you know this information, but yet your brain is still processing it and helping it to go into more of long-term storage. But again, repetition is key and, and very crucial and important. And also having the opportunity to um, do the Cengage work, right? So I'm only asking that you do 
the test after each, at the end of each section, right? We, we discussed that as far as Cengage homework. Um, but you should do, you should try and test yourself and go on other websites and, and take different quizzes and tests and such regarding the information that you're studying. Um, you know, all the grad schools do this, folks. All grad schools, they all have um, sample type quizzes and tests out there for the information that you're studying. So this way you continually are exposing yourself to challenging questions so that it makes you think, challenges you to think, and really challenges you how to really process this information in such a way that you're thinking about it critically. Okay, so very important. And again, coming back to this, this is just a great work, a great picture, a great image that you can just kind of look at, focus at, review over and over, and get to the point where you're like, okay, I remember that sympathetic, we're talking about the sympathetic chain ganglia, so there's a short preganglionic neuron, long postganglionic neuron. Parasympathetic is opposite, so on and so forth, right? So you need to do this. I would tell you also that when you're thinking of studying this information and realizing that, well, what's taking place as far as sympathetic stimulation? What's taking place as far as as the result of parasympathetic stim stimulation. Well, if you review and study the one, the sympathetic, then you'll know the opposite for the parasympathetic. And remembering those little, you know, SLUDD, the rest and digest, the prepare the body for action, the fight or flight, keep those in your mind. That'll really help you to critically think about a question where, um, so you're asked something along the lines of, as far as uh, pupillary, um, dilation would be as a result of what stimulus what aspect of the autonomic nervous system stimulation <clears throat> and we would say that it would be the sympathetic stimulation because for it to be for the pupil to be dilated it would open up and allow for more light to enter in so that you're really aware of your surroundings and have as much light entering in so that you have as best chance of seeing whatever it is that you possibly need to see in order to run or to fight, whatever that the, the call might be. So it's dilation. Parasympathetic would be pupillary constriction. That's just one example of. And I'll show you also that, and we have it in the, the tech in the uh, PowerPoint here. Let's see, did I it? Oh, I guess I lost it. All right. But there are different tables for Let's see. I think I looked it up before because I wanted to show you. Here we go. Yeah. So there, folks, there are many different tables that you can look up as far as you see here. So this one, this one in particular, but there are many, and I would recommend that you review and look at them and go over them. Okay. But here's just one that I picked out. Oh, I can't make it bigger. Okay. But you can see here, pupil, right? As far as dilation, sympathetic, parasympathetic constriction. So memorizing this aspect of sympathetic stimulation will help you then to know the opposite of, okay? Okay. And you'll see here as far as enteric nervous system, right? Consists of nerve plexuses. Uh, present within the wall of the digestive tract. And very important knowing that, again, we're not thinking about what's taking place at all the different aspects of our digestive system, whether it be in the esophagus and the act of deglutition of swallowing or the act of what's taking place in the stomach as far as the acid levels and the churning that's taking place and creating the, um, the chyme, which will then enter into and small spurts into the small intestines and particularly the duodenum first and what's taking place as far as then all aspects from absorption, digestion and absorption to then in the large intestines uh, as far as the aspects of reabsorbing all the water and allowing for the movement of the fecal material to go out of the body, right? So quite, quite entailed as far as the enteric nervous system in its role, okay? And you'll see here, as far as, uh, again, showing you sympathetic axons reach organs through these different nerves and groups of nerves in different areas present within from superior to inferior as far as through all areas. We'll see as far as the uh, parasympathetic, again, looking at, I said to you, you need to remember these as far as cranial nerve three, seven, nine, and 10. 
right? And what their what their terms, what three is oculomotor, seven is facial, glossopharyngeal nine, and ten for the vagus nerve, right? And realizing that, pretty cool stuff. This is just review. Looked at this already and reviewed it, but just giving it to you again another way. I'm going to move from this for a moment there. Move from this for a moment. Look at this here as far as, yeah, here we go. This is the one I wanted to show you. So you see here on the left-hand side, what does this represent? Well, this would represent, so if we T1, L2, sympathetic division, here would be cranial sacral, three, cranial nerve seven, three, seven, nine, and 10, as well as S2 through S4, we're looking at cranial sacral, looking at parasympathetic stimulation and seeing all the different parts of the organs and organ systems present that are being stimulated by these, these systems, okay? Uh, pretty fascinating, very important. And just uh, trying to give you some more information here as far as uh, uh, different types of images I added just to help you to kind of understand and, and process this information. So let's stop for a moment. Let's stop for a moment. Okay. All right. So are, are there any questions or input right now that anybody would like to add uh, before we move on? You okay. I could tell you more stories about bears. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll belay the uh, <laughs> nightmares I've had regarding bears, and we'll move on. You have to you have to laugh, right, folks? Honestly. So the neurotransmitters, right? So I already said to you uh, that regarding uh, the uh, sympathetic division, we have at the first synapse we're going to have for preganglionic neurons, we're going to have acetylcholine will be released. Okay. At the second postganglionic neuron, what's going to be released? Norepinephrine, epinephrine. Okay. Now, so if we think about these these terms here, so does every kind of nervous system have a sympathetic? So, okay, good good question, Kayla. So so really, when we're thinking of as far as uh, throughout the whole body, there is sympathetic and and parasympathetic stimulation to many parts of the organ systems. Absolutely. Okay. So that's important to know that you know, depending upon, not all, but there are most areas of the body are, have some type of innervation regarding sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation, right? As far as uh, acetylcholine is concerned, so acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter, norepinephrine neurotransmitter, we would say that the neurons that release acetylcholine would be cholinergic. So you see that choline here, choline here, cholinergic neurons release acetylcholine adrenergic neurons release norepinephrine and epinephrine. So interesting that, and, and really, where are we talking about as far as where is this coming from, epinephrine, norepinephrine? It's coming from the adrenal medulla. So hence the term adrenergic is not off the mark there, right? So cholinergic neurons, right, include all preganglionic neurons, both sympathetic and parasympathetic division. I didn't mention that to you, but I'm gonna say that to you now. I, I said about the sympathetic, but all preganglionic neurons, right? Two neuron systems, two synapses present in the autonomic nervous system, whether it's sympathetic or parasympathetic, the preganglionic are all cholinergic neurons. So they release what? Acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter. All parasympathetic postganglionic neurons and some sympathetic, right? Will also be cholinergic. But if it's going to, but most sympathetic postganglionic neurons will be adrenergic. Most will be adrenergic. Uh, let's see here, as far as then receptors are concerned. So in describing the specific type of receptor that would receive the neurotransmitter, so we would say what? We would say that a cholinergic receptor receives, binds to acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter, will bind to a cholinergic receptor. Okay, that makes sense. And then an adrenergic receptor, is where epinephrine, norepinephrine will bind to. That's pretty easy also to understand. Now know that as far as there are types of cholinergic and types of adrenergic. When we think of cholinergic receptors, we think of nicotinic and muscarinic. And at this point in time, what I would like you to know is that all this means is that certain cholinergic receptors have been found to uh, also 
allow for, because cholinergic, any type of receptor throughout the body, right? Whether it's for neurotransmitters, uh, whether it's for uh, hormones, they are specific receptors. Now, can other types of receptors, can other types of chemicals mimic the chemicals that would bind to those specific receptors? Yes. And so nicotine and muscarin, which would be uh, a fungi, nicotine and muscarin both will be able to uh, be binding to cholinergic receptors. So some will bind, so nicotine, those cholinergic receptors that re bind to nicotine would be called nicotinic. Those that are binding to muscarin will be called muscarinic, and they are cholinergic receptors, okay? In the case of adrenergic, we have alpha and beta receptors. And this is really important to know that there, these are further subdivided into categories Alpha 1, beta 1, alpha 2, beta 2. And if you're going into nursing and such, as far as pharmacology is concerned, you'll learn more regarding what takes place as far as um, um, these beta receptors in particular, but also alpha receptors regarding what's taking place as far as certain um, medications that can bind and block then preventing these um, neurotransmitters from causing a stimulatory effect. So think of uh, for high blood pressure and such, and so in heart rate, so lowering that would be a beta blocker. So a chemical that we take into our body, a drug that we take into our body that blocks the beta receptors present on the heart to not allow it to respond to, prevent it from responding to epinephrine, norepinephrine, which would what? Increase heart rate, increase blood pressure. Right? Just an example of. Um, also regarding, um, uh, here's another one too, I, I wrote down here, albuterol, right? If anybody has any type of bronchodilator and such, this can also act as on the beta-2 adrenergic receptors present within the um, respiratory system and allowing for bronchodilation, right? Opening up of the uh, contracted, uh, very tight um, tubes present through in, throughout the respiratory system and allow for a patient to breathe easier. So again, that's not our focus, but this is, helps to provide a foundation when you do go to your subsequent, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, and uh, Ruth, wait, let me come back, Ruth. I missed, I missed your uh, input there, but um, working with addiction patients and learned about how the medication works on the brain to block using, understood, yeah. So, yeah, and you know, really what, what goes on with, um, and we we looked at this and addressed this when we were studying the neurology in AMP1, but seeing what happens as far as how uh, these different chemicals that we take in, different substances that can uh, really uh, cause issues with the different uh, receptors and either increase or block the ability to respond to uh, serotonin and dopamine and such, and as a result, um, hijack the nervous system with these different drugs and such, and uh, things that we're taking in that, and, and also not just only drugs and alcohol and such, but also, you know, like other issues like, you know, sexual addiction, these all addictive type behavior kind of hijacks what's taking place within the nervous system. And really, again, just like if you were to hijack a plane, you're taking control instead of who should be taking control of that plane or who you should have control over what's taking place with your body. But the sad thing with addiction, and, and I have a, a grandfather who has since passed away many years, um, my father's father, who uh, who was an alcoholic for over 50 years. And uh, and he made, him, he made things right with the family at the end. But man, I have to tell you, I mean, uh, to the point of like threatening to kill our family when, my, when I was a little boy and my, my parents and... It was just uh, sad stuff. So addiction sucks. Addiction is just, uh, no matter what that addiction is, it's just, uh, it's devastating to families, folks. It's very sad. So to, to um, I tell folks this, that as far as working with, and again, I, I said in the first three years of my practice, I spent time working in a town where um, there was the state, ho one of the state hospitals present, and many of my patients had some type of, uh, mental health issues and such. And, and really, you know, there are things that can be controlled and there are some things that, that can't, you know, that, that, you know, there's issues that, that they have a hard time 
controlling behavior and such. And and so, you know, it's easy to just look at people and go, oh, they're this or that, and they haven't done this or that. But, you know, until you've been in the shoes of someone who who has a family member that deals with addictions and deals with different mental health issues or or uh, or have someone in your own family or people that you know personally or whatever, but, you know, um, don't be so judgmental. It's not an easy life for many people, folks. I have to tell you that. And uh, and the stigma of mental health issues. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I'm sorry it gets me a little like, because it, uh, you know, it hits home with stuff with, uh, with my grandfather and how how he affected. You know, we had a very large family, and and really how uh, the effects that can one person can have that can, you know. So I say this to you all as far as with you know getting out into practice and working with people. One person can be a force for good and really do an amazing things. Just one person making change for others in, in other people's lives and uh, and helping others and doing good for others. Um, but uh, but one person can also create like a, a devastating force in a family that can really be quite sad and have, you know, devastating implications and, and, and uh, bad things going on. Uh, for many for many years and it just really affect a lot of people so sad stuff so do all that you can to do good <laughs> that's important right so let's let's sorry right? so we're going to go through this uh neurotransmitter but we already did that here just to, yeah, so we have a few more slides to review. And I mentioned to you regarding this as far as the sympathetic and parasympathetic effects and such. So I would focus on sympathetic. Memorize that, review that, go over that. And this is only just one table. There are many tables that you can look at as far as the information. And you should make yourself aware of what sympathetic in comparison to parasympathetic uh, stimulation can cause as far as the effects are concerned. So please review that and go over that. Here you're just seeing another um, image regarding um, anxiety is concerned and what's taking place as far as uh, from the sympathetic division, how that's creating a situation where um, part of the, so when you go for a job interview and you're under sympathetic stimulation and you're kind of, you know, you're anxious and such, you do get a dry mouth. You can sweat a little bit, right? So there are different things that can go on as a result of this uh, even though it's a perception of fear, it can be very real. So anxiety is nothing to, to, to just set aside and say, oh, it's not a big deal and just get over it because anxiety can be a very real issue for, for and is a very real issue for many people. And here we have as far as I showed you this earlier there, but just giving you a good you know image to keep in mind as far as what's taking place with the parasympathetic input on the right, viewing right, and on the left, as far as the sympathetic input and all the organs that are being enervated by. And you'll see here, as far as, let's see here, so uh, reflexes are concerned. So autonomic reflexes control most of the activity of visceral organs. So the viscera, we would say another term used for the organs, visceral organs, uh, the glands and blood vessels and such, okay? Autonomic reflex activity is influenced by the hypothalamus. And again, this is the key issue here that knowing that, hypothalamic control and those nuclei, those areas of neuron cell bodies present within the central nervous system, how they, that small area of the brain has such a very important control over many aspects of homeostatic control over the body. Really important. And you'll see here as far as for the enteric nervous system also uh, having uh, local reflexes that can take place so that your brain can really kind of like working independently of uh, the the central nervous system because it's just automatically reacting to what's taking place as far as these local reflexes uh, of the enteric nervous system in the digestive tract. Okay, so you'll see here as far as um, just, just a simple uh, input as far as the heart is concerned, right? So sympathetic inf influence and reflexes can increase heart rate, right? We get that as far as it's preparing the body for action. So what would it do also? It could increase heart rate, which would increase blood flow to the musculature, skeletal muscle, which would allow you to run or fight, right? 
um, and the opposite would be parasympathetic control. And folks, you can do this also. You can stimulate some parasympathetic influence by by doing um, slow belly breathing, right? So where your where your abdomen really expands when you're breathing, and allowing for that to really that nice deep um, slow breathing. Hold it, relax. This can really help to bring about more of a calm. So when you are stressed out, when you do have some anxiety, we all deal with it at times, right? We all do. We're all we're we're human. You know, none of us are, we're not robots, right? So we can react to stressors in our lives. And so what can we do? So we can do at least these slow breathing and different types of techniques that try and just calm our bodies down a bit, right? And here you're seeing as far as uh, uh, dilation and constriction, again, dilation for sympathetic, constriction, parasympathetic influence. And uh, interesting here as far as the cerebrum, uh, cerebellar hemispheres and the cort cortical region of the brain uh, and the emotional brain, the limbic system, right? And remember that the hypothalamus is a part of that emotional brain, that limbic system, right? Um, the hypothalamus also, again, we said master controller of the autonomic nervous system and really the endocrine system because hypothalamic control affects what's going on with the pituitary gland, which we would say is the master gland of the endocrine system. So hypothalamic control, the hypothalamus, has control over the master gland, which is the pituitary. Another term we can use for the pituitary is the hypothesis. And recall that I mentioned in the video on Monday, anterior hypothesis is the adenohypothesis. It's glandular tissue. The posterior pituitary is the neurohypothesis. This is neural tissue. Okay. Now, this is interesting, and I've mentioned this to you in the past, but realizing that, so as far as the autonomic reflex center present within the um, brainstem for uh, pupillary size, lacrimation, salivation, coughing, swallowing, deglutition, digestion, heart rate, force of contraction, blood vessel size, um, respiratory rate, all very important as far as medulla oblongata, brainstem and such. And so I, I've mentioned this before, that how we can take something like a, a simple over-the-counter cough medicine and it doesn't really work on the pharynx on the throat it really works on the brain stem as far as calming down uh, coughing and such and so realizing that hey follow the directions if you need to take cough medicine but really you know be careful with it because people are abusing cough medicine in order to create a high for themselves but realizing that hey they're also affecting many other areas like heart rate you know um Blood vessels, they're affecting their blood pressure, their respiratory rate, as well as their heart rate. And if you sedate this area, right, too much, uh, can it be catastrophic? Yes, it can. And you'll see here, as far as uh, in the spinal cord, we're looking at as far as the void, voiding, being able to urinate, uh, defecation, erectile tissue response, ejaculation, all reflexes present within the central nervous system and of the spinal cord. Okay. Now, this is interesting also as far as, again, like I mentioned to you just earlier there regarding um, the ability that you can receive training in order to um, measurement of physiological responses and try to calm, bring a more calm sense to yourself and, and learn. You can get hooked up to a machine so that you can see what's going on with your um, blood pressure and your uh, how um, you can do what you can on your own in order to enhance relaxation and bring about more of a parasympathetic response, okay? So being adrenaline junkie is not such a good thing really because um, epinephrine is meant to be used um, at periods of time of our life of stress, but really, you know, we should be under primarily parasympathetic stimulation. And those of us that have issues with that sympathetic stimulation, you might need to take blood pressure medication and other medications in order to calm the body down so that you're not really burning your body out. Yeah, burning the different systems out, like the cardiovascular system in particular. 